great pleasure to Henry Adams, uh, who's currently at Duke and uh, the IMA. And he'll be uh, speaking to us on the Via Torres Groups Complex with a Circle. So I think this is uh, really great that somebody has put the effort in to look into uh, at least one particular example in kind of complete detail uh, to see how some of these constructions that we use all the time uh, really work or to understand how they work in this uh, nice example. So, uh, thank Henry. I'd like to thank Peter for organizing the research seminar and the IMA, both for organizing the seminar and for um, funding me as one of their postdocs. So, this joint work with Michael Adamasek, the University of Copenhagen, and um, I'll also be mentioning joint work with Cole Trevitt, now at California State Bakersfield, or sorry, California State San Bernardino, and Chris Peterson at Colorado State University, and Brian Frick moving to Cornell next here. Um, I literally do not know who is in my audience, so please interrupt me if I need to slow down or if you have questions. Um, thanks. Okay. Through the motivation behind the Torships complexes before we study the case of the circle, um, here's a data set and you might ask what is the shape of this data set or how might I teach a computer to recognize the shape of this data set. We begin by imagining that you, you grow balls around each point in the data set. And the philosophy of persistence is, uh, hopefully you can see my mouse, I believe you can. We might have small holes, like at this, like the small hole in the top left corner, that appears and then disappears right away. Whereas we have holes, such as the big hole around the entire circle, that persists a little bit longer. And so this allows us uh, to the length that a topological feature lasts as your significance. So we might regard this small hole as noise, a product of sampling uh, information, whereas this larger hole is perhaps a feature in our data set. And we don't have union of the balls on the computer. Um, you could build a space called the check complex that's homotopy equivalent to the union of the balls. That actually is computationally difficult in higher dimensions. Today we'll talk about the viator strips complex, which is a, an approximation to that. So we'll define the viator strips complex for you. Inputs, it's defined for any metric space X. Input is a choice of scale parameter R. I might call this a connectivity parameter or a distance threshold. One comment about the metric space X, we often think of metric space X as being a finite metric space, but soon we'll consider examples where the metric space is uh, an infinite number of points, in particular it might be a manifold. Space X and scale parameter R, the Torres Schrips complex is defined as follows. Its vec set is all the points in our metric space. This might be infinite set if we're building the Rips complex of a manifold. And we have finite simplex um, of our metric space sigma as a simplex in the ribs complex if that diameter is at most r. So it means that all pairs of edges between any two points in our set sigma are within distance at most r. For example, when, when r is zero, our implicit complex is just uh, the data set. And increase the distance or scale parameter r a little bit, and some of these edges appear. And when three vertices are within distance, pairwise distance r, then we add in a two simplex. Um, here we have four vertices that are pairwise within distance r, so we added in a tetrahedron and keep increasing the scale parameter. And the same philosophy applies feature this hole you might regard as noise because it doesn't last for very long or this bigger hole uh, be more representative of the actual shape of the data. Any questions? I'll go here with uh, these applied to data analysis. Let me give you one example of a data set that I think is beautiful and isn't as well known as our in our community as it perhaps should be. This is the cyclo data set, 8, 8, 16 means uh, we have a ring of eight carbons, 
and each carbon has two hydrogen atoms sticking off of it. So here are three different uh, pictures of possible configurations of a cyclooctane molecule. A point cloud where each configuration of this molecule is one point in our point cloud. How that? Well, in total we have 24 atoms. 8 plus 16 is 24. The atom can be encoded as its x, y, z coordinates in, in three-dimensional space. So that gives us 24 times 3, or 72 uh, coordinates. And configuration is a point in 72-dimensional space. Now, authors below, Martin, Thompson, Kutzius, and Watson, did a lot of work figuring out how to sample points relatively evenly from this data set. They use Viator ships complexes to uh, reconstruct the shape of the space at first. They actually have a triangulation procedure. Uh, without that this data set is served, as you see on the outside, with a Klein bottle glued in. Um, it looks like this hourglass shape in the middle. The Klein bottle and the sphere intersect along two circles of singularity. This one at positive. 30 degrees um, latitude, say, and this other one at negative 30 degrees latitude. All right, so beautiful shape appears in nature as the configuration space of a molecule with, this, with a Klein bottle glued inside. And I'm um, including this because triangulating this space is hard, but if you just wanted to measure its homology groups, you build the viator schrips complex on top of this data set and persistent homology to approximate the homology groups of this sphere and clown bottle. Wait, is this, uh, is this 3D or this is a projection of the 72 dimension? It's a projection from the 72 dimensions down to 3D. And that's why the Klein bottle looks more like an hourglass than, than you, what you would guess a Klein bottle usually looks like. So, so is what's the intrinsic dimension? Is actually, what is the intrinsic dimension of this thing? The dimension is in 72 dimensional space. All right. well, you mean the intrinsic. dimension of the shape or of the ambient space in which the data set lives? Uh, well, it's embedded in 72 dimension, but what sort of, if I were taking each of the manifold piece, what is the sort of dimension with respect to the manifold? The two-dimensional manifold with singularities. And I actually knew that a priori. Um, the chemistry strength puts constraints on the angles and the length. And all these points were lying on a um, algebraic variety of dimension two. So it's like a two-dimensional stratified space is embedded in 72 dimensions. That's right. Dimensional stratified space embedded in, in 72 dimensional space. Yeah, so very beautiful work. And uh, I recommend you guys uh, uh, check it out. And then to be focusing on the circle, so let me show you another uh, Viator ships complex built on a finite set of points from the circle. I want to make one observation. The observation is at this point in time, we recover the homotopy type of the circle. At this point in time, you might guess that the complex is, is contractible. And one of the lessons that we'll learn is, is that this complex right here is not necessarily contractible, even though it looks like it ought to be. We increase the scale parameter so that uh, we've passed the diameter of the circle and all edges appear, then it's certainly contractible. It's a full simplex on the number of vertices. But before we get there, it need not yet be contractible. All right. Let me give you some of the prior theory about Viator ships complexes. And really, this is the motivation for why it's not a bad idea to use them in data analysis. In 1995, and looking at the reflex of a manifold, so infinite uh, number of vertices, this is going to be an infinite dimensional simplicial complex, right? Whenever r is above zero, we're always going to have an arbitrarily large number of points on this manifold within this r. And so the simplicial complex is going to be infinite dimensional. Now, if you start with a compact Riemannian manifold, and the distance threshold sufficiently small, then the complex is homotopy equivalent to original manifold. So you are the homotopy type that you started with. All you, you could 
more formal, it's, it's uh, roughly speaking, R needs to be small compared to the injectivity radius of the man. Now, we often only have a finite subset from our space, and this theorem by Lotchev helps us out in that setting. It said if X is, a, is gromov hausdorff close to your manifold, if you don't know what gromov hausdorff close means, think, for example, that X might be a sufficiently dense, perhaps, finite sample of your manifold. A sufficiently dense finite sample of our manifold, we build the Ribs complex on the finite sample, our radius parameter R is sufficiently small, then we can recover the homotopy type of the manifold. Okay. Now, the results are only for R sufficiently small, but this is a homology. You know, the philosophy that I talked about at the beginning is uh, increasing the scale from small to large and observing what happens over all choices of scale and what gets over large choices of scale. So these theoretical guarantees apply when R is small. Very little is known of what happens when R larger, even though in practice we increase the scale parameter when using persistent homology. So that's the motivation for stem spaces, uh, rips complexes with larger choices of R. Three. So these complexes, uh, they have two of them Leopold Beatoris and Ilya Rip. Introduced uh, complexes to extend the theory from simplicial complexes to metric spaces. So, um, you can metric space, we get a simplicial complex, and therefore now we can do homology on metric spaces. Complexes to study um, hypergroups. So, if you take a hyperbolic group, equip it with a word metric to turn it into a metric space. Um, if the resulting metric space is, say, uh, delta hyperbolic, then let's prove that the viator strips complex of that metric space is connectable as soon as the scale parameter is bigger than four delta. Okay. So now I'm going to, um, it's the main result of the talk. We're getting the Ritz complex of the circle, an infinite number of vertices, one for each point in the circle. Metric on the circle, it's just the path length metric. And I'm going to say the circumference of the circle is one. So the geodesic metric on the circle. Uh, ask what happens if I instead use a different metric, which is the metric induced from viewing the circle as a subset of Euclidean space. The exact simplicial complexes that appear for one choice of metric appear for the other choice of metric. So they appear at slightly different filtration times, but you get the same family of simplicial complexes. Certainly, this uh, this choice of metric is is just a choice, and the same results hold for different filtration times if you instead use the metric induced from the Euclidean space. But using the path length metric, the distance around the circle is one. And I care about the radius or the connectivity parameter um, than one half. Because once the connectivity parameter is one half, then we've reached the diameter of the circle and get the full simplex. And it's contractible. It's homotopy types. First, we're going to look at generic choices of scale parameter R between L over 2L plus 1 and plus 1 over 2L plus 3. And L is just an integer. L is zero, I get zero, and there's one, um, L over 2L plus one is one third, when L, two, L over 2L plus one is two fifths, et cetera. So these are the, um, the same values of the connectivity parameter, zero, one third, two third, three sevenths, four ninths, and in between there is a, is a, um, a generic value of the scale parameter. Hans theorem said we need to remember the circle when the radius is sufficiently small, and we, we see that. But then at a scale parameter one third, we then get the sphere. At two fifths, we get the five sphere. At parameter three sevenths, we get the seven sphere. We gain higher odd dimensional spheres, often, often to, uh, you know, I suppose, 
until finally you add scale parameter one half, the complex becomes contractible. Transition times, one third, two fifth, three seventh. Well, an infinite wedge sum of the intermediate even dimensional sphere. So at one third, we have an infinite wedge sum of two spheres. At times this, we have an infinite wedge sum of four spheres. Okay. <clears throat> of the theorem. All right. These are pictures for the relevant new simplices that get added at these various times. So, so in time one third, we haven't yet added this equilateral two simplex. And when everything is homotopy equivalent to the circle. Once we add this equilateral two simplex uh, and all of its rotated copies, that's when we get the three sphere. And at time two fifths and three sevenths, well, at time two fifths, we get this regular four simplex. At time two sevenths, we get this regular six simplex. Right. Pretty most important part of the talk is coming up right now. I want to give you the geometric picture for this transition from the circle to the three sphere. And it's not precisely how the proof goes, but this is one of those cases I would argue where the geometric intuition is more informative than the proof. See that proof as well. More important here is the geometric intuition. The mode is transition from the circle to the three sphere. I want a three sphere as a decomposition of two solid tori right? along their boundary torus. Okay, there's one solid torus, another solid torus, and glued together along their, their boundary. So this is a common way of decomposing the three sphere, or three dimensional space plus a point of infinity as two torus. All right. All right. So, as follows, um, when the radius parameter is close to one third, but not yet one third, this complex is a circle that's very fat, a very fat circle. And I want you to think of that very fat circle as the first solid torus. This is what we got from the Ribs complex when R was close to, but not one third. How we're going to glue in a circle's worth of disks to that solid torus. So here's how we glued one disk onto that solid torus. The equilateral two simplex that appears is one disk that we've glued in the middle of that torus. But of all rotations of this equilateral two simplex, you know, we can rotate it around the circle. And so if we do all those rotations, we get a circle worth of disks that's glued on to our original solid torus to get three. Here. So, just a cartoon picture. Here is our Ribs complex, a solid torus when the radius parameter was close to but not yet one third. And now, the one third threshold, I glue in this disk, which is one equilateral two simplex, and it's rotated copy. So, think of this rotated copy, um, this is another rotated copy. I pass to the point at infinity to get the next rotated copy, and eventually I get it back to where I started. So when R is slightly bigger than one third, uh, the space between all these disks that I've glued in is filled filled in. So I get the uh, solid torus union torus, the entire three sphere. Could interrupt you and get you back up a little bit. I, I'm, I'm confused here. With the so, your slide. Yep. So so it's less than one third. We have. All of the triangles, right? We have probably many triangles. Yes, but but triangles all live near the boundary of the circle. So we we don't yet have this triangle, but we have angles that are all on say the left side of the circle. Um, what do you mean by that? I don't know this picture that I draw for you. Yes, yes. So that's a picture of a triangle who would appear at time before one third. I, okay. And, and before time one third, we have a lot of triangles that look like that. We have um, simplices of, heart, of arbitrarily high dimension that are, say, one side of the circle. Okay. And that gives us the, and they wrap all the way around. So that gives us S1. 
Um, oh, yes, yes, yes. So the, the S1 right here um, comes all those simplicities on the back of the circle. So the time one third, no we projected it into the plane, no simplex would project down to the origin. At third, that's when the first simplices whose projection contains the origin appear. So before time one third, take your rips complex, project it to the plane, and then you're missing origin. So you can imagine contracting away from the origin. So two simplex that I drew for you, uh, how I project that down into the circle. Well, it, it, it's project doesn't hit the end, so I can just project away from the origin. So right. That two simplex to the side. One yeah. of these equilateral two simplices, which refers to time one third, then do that uh, projection trick to, to map everything back down to the circle. And, and, and what you're trying to explain to us is the transition from R being less to one third to R being one third or R being bigger than one third? First, both, both. <laughs> um, let me try the transition to exactly one third. Okay, so you were talking about the solid torus or the two solid tori, which, which is R3. Um, how do that, where do you see that coming in? Yeah, let me let me get to the solid torus by first talking about um, time one third. Time third is when we have an infinite number of two uh, uh, two spheres. Okay, so I'm going to the other picture. Before time one third, I have this very fat circle. At third, I glue in an uncountable number of equilateral two two simplices. And that's what these discs are supposed to represent, all those two simplicities. Okay? And exactly one third, there's no jelly filling in the space between those different two simplicities. So they're all holes in between these discs. So um, each hole between uh, sort of adjacent discs gives you a sphere. Exactly one third. Once scale parameter is slightly past one third, this between all those discs that I've glued in, fit in and be the entire circle's worth of discs, the entire um, extra solid torus giving me. Uh, um, before I just have S1 cross D2, I just have the fat circle on the left side of the scheme. At in this fat circle, and I've glued in. Uh, a lot of disks, and I get a lot of copies of the two sphere. Right, because I circle, I glue in one disk to get the disk, I glue in a disk to get the sphere, glue in a disk to get two copies of the sphere, glue in the disk to get three copies of the sphere. And then when the risk is slightly bigger than one third, then the, the space between all those disks fills in, get a whole circle's worth of disks to give me three space. Uh, this, is, uh, this is sort of the main uh, point to make in the talk, so definitely ask. Now's a good time. Um, at equally one third, yeah. you are saying it's basically a wedge. So if I did it correctly, at it's a it's a disk, which is in your station a Torah, right? Uh, and then uh, at one third, you have infinite number of copies. Discs that is attached to it, so it's essentially t attaching a wedge of disks to the top of the torus along the boundary. Is That's that what right. The way I think it is as as following. First of all, I say that in a moment um, we'll see fine approximations of this, where instead of using an infinite wedge sum of two spheres, we'll have one two sphere and then two two spheres and then three two spheres and then four two spheres. So you'll see you'll see that, which will be nice. But also um, the way I think of it is. Is you put the circle. What, there we go. I started the circle. Glue in one disc to get the disc. Glue other disc to get the two sphere. Glue the disc to get two copies of the two sphere, etc. Okay. And then you're joining that. Uh, this confused me a little bit. In the next page. Uh, we figure it's not glued along the centroid of the fat fat horse, is it? It can be glued anywhere. It just is it 
the significance of where it's glued, right? As long as it's on the boundary, it's fine. Sorry, Centroid? Um, I'm just, I guess this is just, maybe maybe this is too much detail, but when you're doing it, if the extra disk you're attaching is attaching, attaching along the boundary of, of, of the proof disk. That's right. This, this is supposed to be a um, representation of this Hagar decomposition right here. Okay. All right. Thanks. So, so, so I, I think I understand the, the R equals one third part now. So we attach all these disks, which are just those triangles in your picture, right? We have uncountable many of them. Uh, and now, when we go past that, you said something about now thinking of those. In. Uh, can you say that in more more detail? Yeah, so, so again, this is uh, this is uh, intuition here. This isn't rigorous, but um, at third, I glue in all rotations of these equal to simplicity. But there's no hedra in the gaps between nearby one. Okay? Once I'm slightly bigger than one third, if I take one equal x and its rotation, I glue in. The um, space between those with a lot of four C's, five simplices, six simplices, et cetera. So, so um, I'm not gluing in a disjoint collection of two cells. I'm gluing in an intercircle's worth of two cells. I'm gluing a solid torus. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so, the proof that we'll give of this theorem is not quite along this geometric. Picture, lines of the geometric picture. I would like a proof that was more geometric. In particular, you can view um, higher uh, same way, but I think a, a, a geometric proof there would be very instructive as well. All right, keep going. Sorry, Henry, if, if, if you don't mind me interrupting one more time. So, Please. So, go, so understand that if you're willing to go back to your <laughs> previous slide one more time, uh, that at three, um, we we left here of uh, the two solid solid tori, uh, and now you say that they have a common boundary of a, cool. you say something about that. Yeah, it doesn't. Uh, um, Uh, excel in this picture um, because really I think of, of one of these toy as being contracted down to just a circle. So um, some of the difficulties and why I don't know how to do a, a, a proof along these lines. I put not along these lines. I think a proof does exist along these lines, but, but the proof that we have is not along these lines. So okay, yeah. thanks. The corollary, since we know how the homotopy type changes over all time, we get the persistent homology. Indeed, if you use the scale parameter, the um, maps are, um, the inclusion maps are homotopy equivalences whenever they can be. Um, so as far as this is the first non-actable connected manifold homology we know all the way out. And it's the circle at first. Um, so we get a barcode in dimension one, and then we get a bar in dimension three, five, seven, et cetera. And I think it's important, for example, if you, we know that um, there's stability for persistence. So a very fine sample of the circle and both the Torshub's complex, you get persistent homology barcodes that look like this. Um, so this is important, first of all, because RIPS complexes are a basic tool that we use. And, uh, um, and we'd like to understand other choices of manifold other side, which is the circle. Well, well. Um, spaces that I might not talk about too much, but I want to mention now is the ambient check complexes. So you really think of check complexes as nerves of balls, where the balls live in some ambient Euclidean space. The complex of an when the balls are constrained to live inside that manifold. So if we're drawing balls in the circle, which are just circular arcs, 
and we're taking the nerve of the circular arcs. Um, and uh, this one half here corresponds to arcs of length one half. So we are a nerve complex of all the arcs in the circle, length r, and before r is one half, half nerve lemma applies. This is a good cover. So if we just get the homotopy type of the circle. Now once the, once the arcs passes one half, then the intersection of two arcs need to be tractable. For example, the intersection of these two arcs is two points. Curve lemma no longer applies. And what we find is we get the same progression of homotopy types in the check complexes. We get the three sphere, the five sphere, the seven sphere, et cetera. So it's interesting. There's an analogy that could be made for the real complexes when the result no longer applies. Then we've got the three sphere, five sphere, seven sphere, et cetera. For AMB complexes, when the nerve lemma no longer applied, we got progression of homotopy types. And also an open question in manifold, what's the ambient check complex of that manifold? And, and interesting to see if there's some relationship in manifolds between the RIPS complexes and the ambient check complexes. Check complexes. Let's go before I'll sketch the proof of this theorem, just using um, finite sets from the circle. And we'll just look at evenly spaced points. So my notation for n evenly spaced points in the circle, the five evenly spaced points, the parameter is either zero, one-fifth, or two-fifths, you have four, uh, five points, the four edge sum of the zero sphere, or the circle, or you the uh, four simplex, which is so interesting happens for six points. Points I can get the circle, the two sphere, which I'll show you in a moment, and the scale parameter is one half. You're contractible. How do this as a two sphere? Well, it's the octahedron. I have maximal simplices, all of dimension two. Six of them, they form the cylinder. And the front face of the cylinder and the back face of the cylinder to get the two sphere or the octahedron. So, quite about how this rips complex gives us the two sphere or the octahedron. You have a cross polytope, which you can always get. So, now let's go to nine points and show how you can get two copies of the two sphere. Well, connectivity parameter one ninth, you just get the circle. Conic parameter two ninths. You get um, the Mobius band, which is homotopy equivalent to the circle. For three ninths, you get two copies of the sphere. How this? There are two types of maximal simplicities. The first nine tetrahedra that look like this guy. So we have this tetrahedra and all nine of its rotations. And those together form a fat circle. Cool. And extra maximal two simplicities. Uh, this triangle and its rotations. So what I have is I start with a fat circle. Uh, circle. I glue in one two simplex to get a disc, glue in a two simplex to get a sphere, and glue in a third two simplex down the middle to get two copies of the two sphere. You guys see that? So it had um, 12 vertices instead of nine. You have four such triangles instead of three, and I could get three copies of the two sphere. So my career, Michael Adamasek, already worked out the evenly spaced point case in prior work, an analytical theorem for the homotopy types of n evenly spaced points. I use this as a table. So the number of points, n over n is our connectivity parameter. So we saw this of six points. That gave us the two sphere, and here are nine points giving us two copies of the two sphere, and points can give us three copies of the two sphere, etc. And you see this entire diagonal row of two spheres of increasing, increasing uh, wedge sums. And I zoom down into the right in this table. As I zoom down into the right, you can see the number of wedge sums in this copy of two spheres keeps increasing. Here we have four spheres along, along this line. The number keeps increasing. Four spheres, we have a, a three spheres. 
in four spheres and the six spheres, we have five spheres. So I just put your eyes and took the limit as the number of points goes to infinity. You might guess our results. You might guess that um, when the is in the third, you get the circle. At root third, you get an infinite wedge sum of two spheres, et cetera. Let me remind how this, well, I'll, I'll skip the remark about how this is proven. You ask me later. All right. So I'll do our proof of the case of the entire circle. First, we need to know what happens for arbitrary finite subsets of the circle. This is that X finite in the circle, the rib complex is one of two homotopy types that we saw in the previous table, either an odd sphere or it's a well sum of even spheres of the same dimension. This is computable in time that's almost linear in the number of points. Indeed, the log x just comes from sorting the points. So if you mean the points in cyclic order, then it's in fact linear in the number of points. This is usually the rips complex is very large. Uh, I, I think it's in the number of points, but linear time algorithm for computing homotopy type in case where the points come from the circle. How does algorithm work? Tell so you when a vertex in a graph is dominated. So then for the closed neighborhood of V, all the vertices that are connected to V, including V itself in a graph. And if every vertex that's connected to V is also connected to U, then we say V is dominated by vertex U. So here's a where a neighbor of vertex V is also a neighbor of vertex U. So v dominated by vertex U. What is that the, in the Viator strip simplicial complex, the link of vertex V is a cone over vertex U. So the link is contractible. So this homotopy equivalence going in the reverse direction, this homotopy equivalence says that when you remove V, you don't use the homotopy type. I think in the reverse direction, when I add V back in, I don't change the homotopy type. So in case, when I add V back in, I'm taking the cone over the contractable link. And so the cone over a contractible link, you don't change the homotopy type. Right. So when this is dominated, you can remove it from the RIPS complex without changing the homotopy type. So um, what we show, you remove dominated vertices and you reach a configuration that's isomorphic as a simplicial complex to a configuration of evenly spaced points. So let me give an example. On the, on the left, vertex V is dominated by vertex U because every neighbor of V is also a neighbor of U. So I can move V without changing the homotopy type. V prime is dominated by vertex U prime because every neighbor of V prime is a neighbor of U, U prime. So move V prime without changing the homotopy type. Certain remaining points aren't evenly spaced but the isomorphic, the RIPS complex is isomorphic to one of the evenly spaced cases. So I'm expecting one of you to unmute yourselves and tell me what's the homotopy type of this remaining RIPS complex. Anyone? Here I go. Yeah, this is the uh, case at six evenly spaced points and we've got the sphere. This is an octahedron. Of course, aren't evenly spaced, but the complexes are isomorphic. Good. All right. So, one technical lemma before um, case of the circle. The lemma is that if n and x prime are both finite sets of the circle, if the parameter is in the right generic regime, and both rib complexes are odd spheres of the correct dimension, the inclusion map is a homotopy equivalence. So is using um, Meyer via torus long exact sequence. It suffices to consider the case where x prime is just x with one more point added, because then we can iterate and add um, two points and three points, etc. With the Meyer via torus long exact sequence, where we write the complex of x along with v as the union of the complex of x along with the post star of the. The 
in our view, torus long exact sequence has the intersection mapping direct sum mapping to the union. The inner of the complex on X with the star is just the link of vertex B. So I've replaced the intersection with the link. And think of that as a cone or a ball around the vertex V. So the closed star is just contractible. So I'm going to remove the closed star from the direct sum. There it goes. I want to show that um, this map is a isomorphism. And then you have two spheres. And the homology between them is an isomorphism. Then the spheres is a homotopy equivalence, as you hope. map I star is an isomorphism. Well, since the Rips complex in X and complex on X union V are spheres of dimension 2L plus 1 by assumption, each of these uh, groups is, is the integers. So a vertex V is itself a Rips complex on the open neighborhood of that vertex. And we'll know that the homology uh, of the link is indeed zero. So, this, um, because the link is a ribs complex of circular points, it's either an odd sphere or an even sphere of uh, a wedge sum of even spheres, or it's contractible. So, we're going to rule out first the odd sphere case. The link can't be an odd sphere of dimension 2L plus 1 because no short or long exact sequence that three copies of the integers in row with zero on either side. And link can't be a wedge sum of odd spheres of dimension 2L because of a long exact sequence that has zeros on either side and then two of the integers with the integer raised to the nth power unless m is zero. The only reason is that the link is contractible to zeros for the homotopy types of or the homology groups of all the links. And that means that this map I star is an isomorphism. And so our technical lemma says when you have two finite subsets, there's odd spheres of the correct dimension, and the inclusion between them is a homotopy equivalent. So now we're going to prove Rips Conner Circle. I'm just going to do this generic case where I mean L over 2L plus 1 and plus 1 over 2L plus 1. Step, we're going to pick a sufficiently dense finite subset of the circle, and the Rips complex of that sufficiently dense finite subset gives us the sphere. And so we're going to show that the inclusion map from this complex on X to the Rips complex of the entire circle, the homotopy equivalence. And we're done. And we have the Rips complex of the circle is the odd sphere of the correct dimension. Step I'm punting on during this talk, but it's essentially the main part of our paper. Uh, the, there's, you've heard of the chromatic number of a graph before. It's, it's the number of colors you need to color the vertices of the graph. There's an analog called the circular chromatic number. We use that to pretty graph invariant. We call it the winding fraction. We get control over this process of removing dominated vertices. Since X is dense enough to remove the dominated vertices, we have control over the resulting um, evenly spaced configuration, which we show is the odd sphere of the correct dimension. And now the inclusion from the um, defense finite subset to the rib to the circle is a homotopy equivalence. We use Weiss theorem. Um, Weiss theorem says since these are PW complexes, it suffices to show that the map on homotopy groups is an isomorphism for, for all um, dimension of homotopy groups. Sketch surjectivity. That's an element of the homotopy group of the Rips complex of the circle. So I'm making an element in this group and I'm showing the map is surjective. So in this homotopy group, a based map from a sphere into the complex of the entire circle. Right. So this is compact. So map F compact, meaning that this uh, map F lands in some final.
Questions from the audience for Henry? So I'm trying to remember, uh, did you say anything about the uh, uh, yeah. Complexity for calculating the homotopy type of the butorous rips complex on the finite circle. So we went for finite subsets of the circle. Um, so here, um, x is right, and so the uh, uh, the values on either side. This is just the size of our data set. Points in sorted order. It's linear in the number of points. It's n log n, where n is the number of points. And, and can you tell us something about the algorithm? Are you looking for these dominated vertices? Exactly. You're removing dominated vertices. Um, and <clears throat> you move them in rounds, and, and the algorithm is very quick for, for plucking out these vertices. Yeah. Rise in other examples? I mean, is this something that people do or should be doing for? for more general view torus rips complexes to speed up calculations? I mean, no, uh, no. But it's special. It's really true that whenever, in any view torus rips complex, you can remove a dominated vertex and, and, um, and the homotopy type. I think uh, the nice things that are going on here is, is that, first of all, on the circle, it's really quick to find vertices that are dominated once you've ordered them. And since what are the possible resulting um, spin that have no more dominated vertices remaining? I'd be very interested in, in for um, rips complexes of points in the plane, could you classify what are the remaining sets of points that don't contain any dominated vertices? Yeah, so I think it's an intriguing idea to try to look at other spaces, but I would guess that if you if you take a Viator strips complex from the wild and you try to remove dominated vertices, you're not necessarily going to get very far. I show you again the, these these plots of the random random number of points. So there's a plot on the x-axis. We have the number of points uniformly sampled from the circle. Well, on the axis, we have the dimension of the resulting spheres. So in this game, we get a wedge sum of six spheres. In this game, we get a single seven sphere. So the reason why we're able to compute rips complexes, you know, on, on more and more points. Very fast. I say this is a, a average over a hundred trials. So we're building a hundred rips complexes on say a thousand points, but then the uh, nearly linear algorithm. So. Um, so the circle, you can make these plots much, much more quickly using that algorithm. Do you have any need to why the picture looks, why this graph looks the way it does? <clears throat> or does, it, does this correspond to the numbers that you had? Yeah, what this graph is plotting on the y-axis is the, for each, uh, say 300 points, we're doing a collection of trials with 300 uniformly random points, and then we average dimension, where the dimension is the uh, dimension of the resulting spheres, if it's a single odd sphere or a wedge sum of even spheres. Um, so what, what we see is the regime when you get to the, the sphere, high odd dimensional sphere, and the reason when you get a wedge sum of even spheres of the of the next dimension lower. So we end when you get to the seventh sphere in this picture, and when you get to the copies of six spheres. So you might think about these dips. What's what's this dip happening between the six spheres and the seven spheres? Well, in, in any single um, tile, as you're adding more points, um, when you reach the seven spheres, you go through a tractable space first. So 
in order to six spheres to seven spheres, you're going to have to pass through contractible spaces and then we're averaging over the dimension. So that's these dips between the six spheres and the seven spheres. So an analogous plot where uh, you could also look at the Betty numbers. So in green, you have the Betty numbers. This is the seventh number, the sixth Betty number, and the Betty number. So Betty numbers can be at most one, but the even Betty numbers can be higher than that. This for a particular R? This R is value? Yeah, this for a particular R. Our theorems are asymptotic as R approaches the critical value from above. Um, that's another question. So going back to the algorithm where you say it's computable almost in time linear yep. when the points are sorted. Um, no, this sounds naive, but does this is this algorithm is to recover the homotopy type of the final ribs complex. Then does the barcode somehow come in free by increasing R from zero to your threshold R? So yeah, this is not an algorithm to compute the persistent homology, as you point out. Um, that's right. And in particular, when we're doing this dismantling process. This dismantling process is for a fixed choice of R. So we're covering the persistent homology up to that R. We're just computing the homotopy type or the homology groups at that value of R. Is there a way where our sort of uh, dominate things by assorted R values so that you can also recover persistent homology somehow? That's a question. Yeah, I haven't thought of that before. Um, that's my question. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'll thank Henry one more time for a great talk. Thanks, Henry. Thank you.